Hi everybody, Ian Bremmer here. Got your world in more than 60 seconds. It's snowing outside in New York and coronavirus continues to play out in the country and across the world. That means you get more than 60 seconds. I got your questions lined up here and ready to go. First, what did you think of Xi Jinping's speech at the Virtual World Economic Forum? Well, his last speech um, at uh, the Real World Economic Forum in Davos, I remember being there uh, four years ago. And given that Trump had just been elected, uh, Xi Jinping, you know, gives this big, we want to stand up and be leaders uh, while the Americans are doing America first. And you know, generally speaking, it was probably the most important speech of the week. Uh, people liked it. Um, this, this is a pretty different environment, not so much because Trump is gone, but rather because uh, support and belief in Xi Jinping is pretty low. I, I will say one thing that was generally well responded to was the a uh, call not to enter into a new Cold War. Uh, anybody in the business community generally supports that. There's so much integration and interdependence between the U.S. and the Chinese economies that when Xi Jinping says we need to find ways to continue to work together, I mean, this is the pro-globalization audience he's speaking to. They generally agree. But otherwise, the message fell pretty flat. So the idea that... Uh, China is going to be globally useful on issues of leadership, um, especially when it comes to anything that might threaten Beijing's sovereignty. They check global norms at the door. And a few examples of that, uh, when she called for support for the rules-based international order, that's an obvious contrast with China's violation of the one country, two systems framework uh, in, in Hong Kong. Um, and, you know, they say, well, that's a domestic issue. Well, actually, that's not what your agreement was with the British handover. And just because you're more powerful doesn't mean that norm doesn't matter anymore. Um, the call for abandoning ideological prejudice uh, in the West, that sounds like, but out of our affairs, we can do whatever we want to Uyghurs uh, when there are a million in concentration re-education camps in our country. Uh, and we'll shut down journalists for even mentioning that if they try to operate inside China for that. The idea that the strong should not bully the weak s sounds like don't blame the United States, don't, you know, U.S., you better behave yourself. Uh, but, you know, what about the way the Chinese are treating Australia? Uh, right now, or a host of other smaller countries that cross um, China's political, economic, um, or 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 national security interests. I mean, the willingness of Beijing to really make you pay when you engage in behaviors they don't like um, is uh, is growing uh, very quickly, along with uh, their international capacity to muscle flex. And then on the pandemic, I mean, China is calling for greater global cooperation, uh, but that also means they need to cooperate in terms of transparency in um, what uh, happened with coronavirus. And let's remember that, you know, there were, from my perspective, two big obscenities in terms of the world, in terms of coronavirus itself and the pandemic. One is the United States leaving the WHO in the middle of the pandemic. It's an extraordinary, uh, you know, antithesis of what a country should be doing, a country like the United States. But even more foundational was China lying to the World Health Organization um, about the lack of human to human spread for a month when we could have stopped this thing so much earlier, could have contained it, especially given the capacity we now see that China has to engage in contact tracing, quarantine and lockdown. And they chose not to. Uh, and that's a serious problem for all of those reasons. This speech was uh, not an enormously well received speech. Um, by those watching. Um, next, why did the Italian prime minister resign? Well, I mean, largely it is over disagreement on how money should be spent uh, in terms of massive coronavirus stimulus, sort of like the disagreement, the big disagreement between Democrats and Republicans on the 1.9 trillion right now. I mean, how green, how sustainable should it be? How much money goes to health care? How much money goes to new technologies? How much to the workers? Former Prime Minister Renzi basically pulled out of the governing coalition over disagreements on that. Um, and they weren't able to get a solid majority uh, in a vote of confidence. That makes it much more difficult to get governance done. That's why Conte resigned. He is the 29th prime minister since World War II. Uh, if he doesn't get elected back in, if they can't put a new coalition together, he'll be the third. They'll have the 30th 
Um, in Italy, Italy's kind of like the Doritos uh, of G20 governments. Crunch all you want. They'll make more. Uh, that's, uh, you know, that's kind of what we're looking at uh, in Italy. Uh, the good news is it's not all that exciting. Um, next, where is the international outrage for what's happening in Ethiopia's Tigray region? And uh, no question, there's a lot of violence. Um, there are obvious uh, human rights breaches across the board. There's danger of famine. There are tens of thousands of refugees. Uh, and this at the hands of of a prime minister of Ethiopia that had won the Nobel Peace Prize. And some saying he should return the prize, just as they were saying that about Aung San Suu Kyi um, for some of her nationalist calls to help support minority repression um, in Myanmar after doing so much to stand up to the authoritarian government. Uh, A couple points here. One is that um, Ethiopia, I mean, talking about um, this level of conflict at a time when everyone's focusing on coronavirus. It's everything gets, everything small and local gets lost in the scrum. But also, um, Prime Minister Abiy in Ethiopia has led the charge in trying to move away uh, from an ethnic led federal government uh, where, you know, sort of different groups. Um, control uh, political power um, to one where um, it's much more of a, a traditional political party system, or should say a modern political party system. Um, and uh, the, the, the Tigray in Ethiopia um, were the group that stood to lose the most party, a minority group that wielded effectively a majority of patronage and power. And, and so the, the, the willingness to blame Abiy for the violence that we're seeing right now, even though he has the Ethiopian army, there's Eritrean military that's involved, it's an ally of his. I mean, clearly he has more power, um, but uh, some of the initial violence uh, clearly came at the hands of local Tigray as well, who refused to recognize um, the uh, Ethiopian election process and the suspension because of the pandemic and instead held their own election, became a breakaway uh, province. And so, you know, in these situations, there is so much conflicted narrative in terms of history, and it's very hard uh, to lay responsibility and blame firmly at the hands of one side in this conflict that those two things together uh, get you why we're not paying as much attention as we perhaps should um, to um, a country with over 100 million people in sub-Saharan Africa and one of the strongest growth trajectories economically in the entire world. Anyway, that's it for me this week. Hope everyone's safe. Please avoid people and I'll be with you again real soon.